Welcome to the Between Two Wheels podcast, where we talk about all things on and between two wheels. I'm your host, Johnny Roblox, and y'all know my co-host, Justin, practicing social distancing as easy bird. And uncle, I miss my alone time, Ken. This episode is being brought to you by <laughs> Get Lowered Cycles, where customer service actually means something. Today's episode is all about your next bike. What's going on, guys? You have no idea how accurate that is. <laughs> So, uh, so no, no it's extremely accurate. Mine is somewhat accurate. <laughs> um, so I have to give credit where credit's due. Tracy came up with that one. Oh yeah, based off of your Facebook posts. You gave right. <laughs> <laughs> um, ah. So as as we see, as with last episode, this episode, Justin is still socially distancing himself from just Ken and I. I think he's just fucking hiding. Uh, poorly but he's hiding yeah i literally have not gone within six feet of another human being for like almost two weeks now are you wearing pants yes i am mm-hmm. yeah i'm not a i'm not a no pants guy no no mm-hmm. i'll do like a no shirt every now and then uh but i'm i'm usually not a no pants guy and i'm always a sock guy too i don't do the barefoot thing what well i mean Okay, I almost I, I, always have socks on. Okay, I can get that. I always have shoes on, whether my, they're my slippers or my flip flops or something. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm that way. I wear flip flops um, all the time. Like even in my own home, yeah. I wear flip flops just because Pero has started pissing on the floor again. Uh oh. Well, he's like ninety, so. Well, and they're probably upset that you're fucking home all the time. <laughs> <laughs> they're rebelling against you. <laughs> So, but they're only pissing. He's only pissing on brand new items to the house. Okay, so that's a thing. Like a box. That's a thing. Yes. <laughs> Every time an Amazon box comes in for Tracy's company, we have to hide it quick. Oh well, I mean that's because he'll piss on it. Well, then obviously they just, you know, they got all those, you know, dead dogs and cats because it's all coming from China. Hmm. Possibly. Yeah. Dude, I just want to let y'all know, like, going through this shit as a already, like, normal day germaphobe. Oh my god! <laughs> you, you, hey, hey, you know, especially once I learned that it can live on surfaces for like days, no matter what you do. Oh Allegedly. my god! Allegedly. <sighs> do, do I need to drop? You know, I've got some, you know, nitrile gloves, the really thick ones, like fourteen mils. Jesus. No, I got some of those in the garage, but I mean, oh I got my some god, five mil. Oh, I like the thick ones. That way they don't tear as easy. Yeah. They're automotive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. And I bought those before the this bullshit virus. <laughs> just started just so everyone knows. I, I bought them for cooking, actually, for grilling and barbecuing and stuff like that. Yeah. They protect your hand a little bit more from the heat, too. Yeah. Yeah. So how is this episode about your next bike? Well, I am hoping to shed some light on how you can save money on the next purchase you make for your motorcycle. Now, you can use some of the tips and tricks that we're going to talk about for buying any vehicle, but this one, we're going to keep it towards motorcycles. And I even I even read part of this to Tracy to make sure it all kind of flowed because she's my litmus test. If she can just hear it. Did you say lip mist? Lip mist. Okay. L I T M U S. Okay. Yeah. I know what you were trying to say. Is that really how it's it, spelled? No, it's spelled L I T H M U S, I believe. But I heard lip mist. Oh, no. Lip mist. No, there's no H. I always. <laughs> oh, boy. Y'all ready, y'all ready to hear a, a fucking millennial thing right here? Okay. I always thought it was lit ness. Like L I T N E S S. Like, how lit is it? <laughs> This is legitness. <laughs> oh, God. I hate how stupid I am sometimes. But no, so I, I, uh. I read part of it to Tracy while she was driving, and she understood it. So I'm hoping that oh my this God. message comes across well. And so. it's a science term. I'm so disappointed in myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, first, purchasing your next bike. So let's discuss actually locating your next bike. Now that the world can actually spell pandemic, 
And with so many retail outlets closing their doors to the public, buying a new or at least new to you motorcycle can be quite tough. Sure, our local dealers here, the Harley dealers, are making it easier to purchase by offering curbside service. Uh, they're doing one-on-one -on -one test rides. They'll bring a motorcycle to your home so you can test ride it. Oh, that's pretty dope. So please, they, please buy bikes. Yeah, they're, <laughs> they're doing everything they can. But how do we know if we're getting the best deal? So here's some things to think about. Do you live in an area that... Shit, I just completely lost my spot. I fucked that allows. up. Allows. Do you live in an area that allows for near year round riding? Oh, yeah. If you do, consider yourself lucky for one, but not because you can ride year round, but because prices of motorcycles and location where riding can happen most of the year are usually cheaper than those where the riding season is much shorter. So, how do you find a bike that isn't local? Websites and apps, of course. The internet. Yeah. Interwebs. C Cycle Trader, Rumble On, etc. All provide great ways to buy a bike. And many dealerships also use these platforms to sell the bike. So why not let Search Tool do all the heavy lifting for you? Yeah. So you're going to have those people who say, I won't buy a bike. I can't ride first. Or how can you trust the person you're buying from? Or how do I get the bike to me if I buy from out of town? So these questions and statement are great things to consider. Buying a used bike online can be very scary. But think about this. If you're buying from a dealership, they will typically throw some sort of warranty on the bike. You know, maybe 90 days or so. Yeah. And they don't want to chance ruining their reputation by selling a lemon to you. So if you're buying from a person... I said I suggest you arrange like a video call with the person. Have them walk around the bike with the camera so you can see it. Have them start the bike. You know, rev it up, flash the lights, honk the horn, do all kind of the, the visual inspection stuff. But also, and this is a hint that I, I, I think a lot of people overlook, but the reason for a video call is not so you can actually see the bike. No, it's, you can see if there's a real fucking person with a real fucking bike. Well, it's so you can see the surrounding area. Yep. Yeah. Because if someone takes pride and takes care of their home, their garage, etc., chances are they take care of their bike. Oh, you'd never fucking sell a bike then. Your garage is a fucking wreck. No. Yeah, my, but my look at the garage is not a enough. wreck. My garage. They know it's just been dropped off and trailered, so. <laughs> Oh, they'd see the trailer and be like, oh, it's got low miles. Oh, yeah, very low miles. Let me guess, 90% of those miles are uh, going back and forth up and down the strip at your local rally? <laughs> but to that point, sorry, I had to get that one in. Uh, when Hasso, well, Hasso is still currently looking for a real dirt bike since he didn't listen to me the first time. Uh, he's sending me these listings, and one thing I told him is never buy a dirt bike whose picture is it leaning up against a house because chances are that is exactly where that bike is stored where it lives yep that is where that bike sat for however many years that guy's owned it yeah it's a good point i personally will not buy a bike on craigslist or ebay unless i'm able to actually go out and see the bike in person that's me yeah yeah but i mean that's that's reasonable yeah but here's the thing now i I buy new bikes. I'm a lot. Not, I'm not trying to flex here. That's just my preference because I know what I do to motorcycles. Well, and and there's a lot that comes with buying a new bike too. There is, and I would say I'm getting better about keeping bikes longer. I, I'm that not yet. Oh, okay. But <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm I'm trying with this one to keep it for longer than a year, um, and I will. I will keep it longer than a year. Like you sound like someone in physical days. therapy, like, oh, you, you took seven steps today. That's a great job. <laughs> baby steps, baby steps. Baby steps. You got to start somewhere. But I've helped people look for bikes and buy bikes that are used. And, you know, look, there's nothing wrong with a used bike. No. 
it's been gently loved or previously loved or whatever they want to throw a buzzword on it. But I am lucky enough to be able to afford a new bike. Well, so I mean, yeah. I, that's what I can afford, but not everyone can. So checking out companies like Rumble On, I said that while I was driving back from, well, while Tracy was driving, I looked it up and I checked on a few bikes from Rumble On and they, they give a 90-day mechanical warranty. Yeah. So at least something like that would be plenty of time for you to check it out, you know, ride it, figure out if there's anything wrong, and then have it fixed. Well, and they bring it right to your door. Yeah. And then... Yeah, it's delivered to you. And then you get to check it out and, of course, take it for a ride. You know, and you've got, like I said, you've got 90 days if something goes wrong with it. Well, that's a 90-day mechanical Yeah, if something goes wrong with it. Yeah. Yeah. That you know it will be fixed. Um, But... You can't trust people. Well, no. I mean, there's so many freaking ways to... Well, hey, I'll, t- I'll, I'll own up to it right now. I got scammed. When? Uh, last week. On? On a... So, it was actually an Instagram ad oh. for this laser engraver. And I'd, <laughs> I'd seen it online. God damn. Okay, Boomer. <laughs> oh, I shit. love this thing because it's portable. <laughs> And you can, like, etch whatever you want into almost any surface. I was like, cool. And it's like 70 bucks. Oh, well, there you go. Okay. I was like, okay, it's a smaller version. The website was legit. I followed all my own standard protocols. I refused to pay for it with my credit card. I used PayPal instead. And, yeah, I made the order. And I clicked on the the shipping link a couple days later to see where it was. Because I figured it was coming from China. The website, no longer active. Mm. <laughs> so I hit up eBay. I was like, or not eBay, um, PayPal. Yeah. And followed a fraud claim. Yep. Shit's going to happen. Yeah. And and look, this is a great PSA. Don't trust the fucking ads on Instagram. Because oh, no. anyone can put an ad up. But, yeah, I followed my claim. And, you know, it's, it is what it is. Shit happens. I'm going to get my money back. Yeah. yeah, but some fucking piece of shit human being in China, because that's where the bank is, that accepted the money. They don't care. No, they're making their money. Yeah. So just be careful on Instagram, social media, because they don't care about who gives them money to put an ad up. They just want the money. They want the revenue. You know, I don't. I don't have a problem buying. You know, anything. Car, truck, motorcycle, whatever off of Craigslist or anything like that. I'm going to buy locally so that I can actually go and see it mm-hmm. start and everything. You know, like some of the things you can obviously, you know, do a walk around of it is, is the bike immaculately clean? Cause that can be a warning sign that, well, maybe it had a leak and he just cleaned the fuck out of it. So you don't see where it was leaking from. Also, you know, Make sure Feel that if the engine's hot if you get th- when exactly, you get there. Exactly, that's what I was going to say. Make sure the engine's cold so you can see how it starts cold. Yeah, cold starts are important. You know, uh, you know things like that. I mean, but like you said, there's, you know, there's an inherent risk with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there is. So, you know, used bikes. That's one thing. And yeah, I I suggest even if you're buying a used bike from a dealership, be leery of it because. Yeah. They, they do what they're required to do uh, as far as inspections and everything go. But a used bike is still a used bike. It is what yep. it is. Yeah. So just be careful and don't buy something that doesn't have a warranty of something. So at least you have some kind of safety net. That's, yeah. that's my big thing on there. I mean, most states have lemon laws. I think every state has a lemon law. Uh, and even in, even in the private world, mm-hmm. if you you know, knowingly sell me something that you are touting as being in, you know, 100% working order, then I can use a lemon law against you. Of course, the the burden of proof is on me set yeah. to prove that you knew yeah. that this problem existed and you failed to notify me of it. In so Texas, it's also very easy to get a legal bill of sale as well to prove that, you know, that way if, if you buy it and, you know, it turns out it was stolen or something like that, you're like, oh, I bought it from this guy. He provided this information, things like that to to cover your ass even more. Oh, yeah. Oh, for yeah. Sure. 
So getting the bike to you is another great area of uh, concern for folks. A lot of different ways you can get a bike from a distant location to your place. You can go pick it up yourself. If you have a car that has a, you know, a trailer hitch on it, drive to the location, rent a U-Haul trailer or something, and then strap it to the trailer and drive it back. You could fly to wherever it is and ride it back. Borrow Buddy's truck. Yeah. You know, shipping services, most all shipping, you know, all actual vehicle shipping companies charge about 500 bucks. So the most I have ever paid to ship a motorcycle, and I've shipped them a few times, 800 bucks. Yeah. I've had a car. I had a 66 Lincoln Continental that I bought in Tennessee, that I bought from a person in Tennessee and had it shipped. That was 1200 bucks. But anytime you start paying for shipping, you have to understand that that's going to cut into the savings. Oh, yeah. So I actually looked it up, a brand new 2020 Fat Boy 114. I know you hate them, Justin. I do, yeah. Terrible bike. But it was a very easy bike for me to find. Multiple Because no one wants to buy them. Yeah. yeah. But it was almost... Nineteen hundred dollars cheaper for me to buy it in Florida than it was for me to buy it in Pennsylvania. Supply and demand—that's what it really comes down to. Oh yeah, you can ride year round, minus some days during hurricane season in Florida. Pennsylvania, you get to ride about six months a year. Yeah. Now there's some hardcore folks out there that's going to leave some comments saying, "Oh well." I ride in 30 below zero temperature, well, blah, good, blah, blah. Good for you. Well, yeah. The average person would only have about six months to ride there. You go to Michigan, and it was about $2,700 cheaper for me to buy it in Florida than it was to buy in Michigan. Damn. And they only have about five months a year, especially the Upper Peninsula. Michigan's taxes are stupid, though. Their insurance laws are ridiculous as well. Well, that's not even, that's just looking at the uh, the sell price. I know, I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> um, so, taking that into consideration, yes, you're going to get us, you, you have a potential for getting a savings by going out of state. Um, especially if you're going into an area that they ride year round. You know, look for, if, especially brand new bikes, because it's going to have a factory warranty and it's brand new. Oh, yeah. So, shop it. You know, something that Tracy and I did. When we were shopping for her heritage, I had her get a listing of all of the dealerships uh, that we were willing to drive to, and send an email and put all of their na- all of their email addresses in the two fields. So they all knew they were this was a sh- we were shopping it. Oh, that's dirty. And you know we put in everything she wanted, even down to the accessories that we wanted to purchase and roll into the deal. And we shipped it out and we sent the email out and we said in there, the best price wins. And I think we sent it out to maybe 60 dealerships. Jesus. Um, and, you know, one in the Dallas area happened to come back and they, they knew the game. Oh, yeah. And we, get, we went to them. They gave it to us for 1500 less than MSRP. That, I mean, they, I mean, that's how that but they they have they can sell that like by like, that they can sell like that in dallas because they're there's fierce competition there's what five dealerships in the dfw metroplex area yeah. maybe six so i mean you know justin you said you know that's dirty but on the flip side of that what dealers you know everyone knows that they're there to make money there's nothing dirty I'm not saying it's dirty and I don't like it. I'm just saying that's... It, it's almost like, you know, when you take two scorpions and put them in a bucket? You oh, y'all didn't do that as a kid, did y'all? Yeah. Oh, okay. Frogs yeah. and grasshoppers, I mean, shit. No, we we did king scorpions and um, yeah. camel spiders. Oh, see, that's see, that's different. That's, you know, that's the military. That's something. <laughs> that's like a rite of passage. <laughs> Catching those little fuckers sucked. But... Uh, but yeah, look, 
it is what it is out there, right? It is what it is. Um, but let's let's really talk about the meat of this subject. And this, you know, the original title of this was "Don't Overpay for Your Next Bike," and this is where it really comes into play. So you found the perfect bike, and now you want to buy it. What do you do? These tips apply, and again like with the buying from another state or from an area where you can get it for a lower price these this game that is played right here that we're about to talk about is in the entire vehicle industry or the oh, automotive yeah. industry but uh most of us will have to finance our motorcycle purchase which is fine but make sure that you are aware of how dealerships make money yes i'm picking on dealerships here and it's because they're the ones who are most guilty of this. A dealer makes money from you in two ways when you buy a bike. The first way is simply the sell of the bike itself to you. They bought the bike for one price. They sold the bike to you for another price, which was is almost always going to be more than what they paid for it. The second way is when you finance through them. Now, you see... Dealerships want you to buy the motorcycle right then. So they remove as many possible distractions of you leaving the store without the bike as they can, which includes financing the bike for you. Now, when you go in and speak with the finance and insurance person, they should have already found the right buy rate for your loan. What do I mean by buy rate? Do you know, have you guys ever heard this uh, um, in financial services, transactions, buy rate or sell rate? No. No. Okay. So what do I mean by buy rate? Oh, I, fuck, I lost my place again. Sorry, bud. Reading's hard. Just sound it out. Yeah, he just made the screen bigger or the font bigger. Getting old. I can make sure he's using his finger. <laughs> yes. What do I mean by buy rate? When a bank extends credit to you, they are buying your debt for a percentage rate, or as we all know it, interest. Now, if there's a buy rate, there's also a sell rate. The sell rate is the interest rate you accepted and signed the contract for. Now, you would think this would just be the rate. Nope. A dealership has the ability to sell you a loan for more than the bank is offering as a way of earning a commission. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah. You told me about this. Okay, yeah. So here's a scenario. A young woman is buying her first new motorcycle, and she is financing it through the dealership. She is fresh out of college and has not built her credit up just yet. She knows that the interest rate is going to be higher because of her credit score. And she has accepted that. She picks out the bike. The price is what she was looking to pay. So she heads in to speak with the F&I dude. F&I is finance and insurance, just in case y'all don't know that. Um, he runs her credit through the, his little finance system. Three banks came back with pretty much similar interest rate. 7% for up to 84 months. While the F&I guy is talking to our customer... He learns that she is expecting a high interest rate. So he tells her that the banks came back with a 10% rate for 60 months. When our buyer says that is too much, he makes it look like he's actually doing something on his computer when in reality he's just looking at Facebook. He then tells her that the loan officer said they could do 9.5% at 84 months. The payment looks so much lower and it is actually lower than our buyer's budget so she signs for it so here's the math on how this looks i just want you to know i really hate this because it reminds me of high school math <laughs> word problems well, the word Fucking problems, word problems. <laughs> so let's say she's buying a new soft tail the final sell price after tax title and registration is twenty thousand dollars the bank's buy rate of seven percent would have made the payments 396 dollars a month for 60 months so this means it would have cost the buyer $3,761 in interest. Our buyer signed the contract at 9.5% for 84 months. The payment 
significantly lower. It's only $327 a month. This will cost our buyer $7,458 in interest. Here's the kicker. This gives the dealership a commission of $3,697 from the bank. Now, I'm going to pause here. Have you guys ever seen this or questioned why am I being told this interest rate when my credit's good? No. No, because I work in the industry and I know exactly why I'm getting the rate I'm getting. Cool. Okay. I know how the systems are built, so I'm, I'm always dealing directly with the institution. Yeah. So no, and I've always gone on. I've always gone in knowing my budget. Mm-hmm. You know, so I mean, I know what I can afford, and part of me is I know that all I can afford is you know twenty thousand dollars. Sure. So when it comes to tax, title, and license, and interest. That was always a factor in that. For yeah, me. that too. Yep. <clears throat> so how do our listeners, who may not know about the tricks and the games that are played, how can they combat this? Well, to ensure you aren't paying $3,700 more than you should, consider getting pre-approved for your financing. Now, I prefer to shop all my favorite financial institutions, so any bank or credit union that I have a relationship with, I'll go to them and see what their rates are. Yeah. Because they tell you what the lowest rate possible is. Now, understanding that you may not have a local bank that you can go and talk to or call or check their website or whatever. You have financial services companies such as, like for Harley, you have Harley Davidson Financial. That is a bank that is solely owned by Harley Davidson Inc. Their sole purpose is to make it possible for you to buy a motorcycle. That's not a, when the dealership calls Harley Davidson Financial Services, the rate you get from Harley Davidson Financial Services cannot be marked up, Hmm. not allowed. So you can actually go online, I think it's a, Harley Davidson Financial, something like that, or just go to harleydavidson.com and look it up. Um, you can actually go get pre approved for your loan without ever stepping foot into a dealership. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So go out there, put everything together that you need, and just know what you can afford. So here's kind of my checklist for purchasing any vehicle. Again, motorcycle, car, whatever. I check my credit score. I have about 30 years worth of free credit monitoring because of the VA, Target, TJ Maxx, and Sony's data breaches. So with the monitoring service I use, I'm able to pull my credit report and score anytime I want. So know what your score is. If you are below a 650, prepare for high interest rates. And you for sure should shop around for financing, period. If you are over 800, not one finance and insurance person will try to raise your rate for a commission. It is too dangerous for them. Because if you have an 800 or higher credit score, you already know the game. You're doing everything right. You're financially responsible. In you can opinion. even cut that down to like 780, sometimes even 760. Right. Yeah. So every bank or financial institution has their own limits where the tiers, the credit tiering comes into play. So once I know my credit score, I then figure out my budget. I have to know how much I can afford, how much I'm willing to afford, etc. cetera. N- now, people don't realize this you may be able to afford $800 a month for a motorcycle. That doesn't mean you should. Well, true. Are you willing to pay $800 a month for a motorcycle? For six years, five years, whatever. Or seven, yeah. Yeah. I'm personally not willing to do that. 
that's me. Hey, people make good money out there. They may say, fuck it. Who cares? I mean, I did. <coughs> Excuse me. I did with my first parley. You know, fresh out of the military, fresh off a of divorce. You might as well have claimed I, bankruptcy I, for all that matter. Oh, I had a bankruptcy <laughs> still on file. Oh, well, shit. Uh, and I had a credit score of about 550. Okay. So I walked in, but I knew I knew my budget. I knew I was going to get hosed on my freaking interest rate. Right. And I did. But I accepted it. I had a $650 a month payment and an 18% interest rate. Ooh, fuck. Jesus. But I had, <clears throat> but I had no credit. Yeah, I've never had credit cards, and I mean the only you know things I've had is you know a personal loan here and, and car notes. Sure. So I had no credit. You know, I didn't know about all that shit until really I was coming out of the military to begin with. Mm-hmm. So I was I was kind of stuck in that position, but at the same time, I mean I had a down payment. You know, I had solid income. So yeah. I accepted that. Yeah. Knowing my budget simply allows me to narrow my search to what I can actually afford. Oh, yeah. <coughs> that coronavirus, man. It is, We're man. We're giving it to each other. The COVID. Um, Just so saying. That's why I'm over here. <laughs> after, after I've done those two things, I'm now going to go locate the bike. Now, with this, I love research. I'm that nerd. I think Justin's right there with me. He's just still in the closet. But uh, um, I'm pretty open about it. <laughs> um, so th- that part's fun for me. But as you all know, I have only bought new Harleys. I'm not trying to do that weird flex. Just my preference here. You just keep bringing it up. Yeah, but you get to yeah, say that's the second time you said it, bro. It's starting to get kind of weird. Yeah. That's two flexes right there. Left and right. Bam, bam. Oh. Hey. I'm just saying, you know, Justin, he, he buys brand new bikes. You bought a brand new bike. So, anyways, I have helped friends with the shopping for used bikes. And I'll say it's a lot harder to research used bikes than new ones. But I have a checklist for used bikes. Here's what I research. I research recalls for that model. I want to make sure that I ask if the recall has already been fixed or if that's something I will have to do after I've purchased the bike. Two, VIN check. So think Carfax for motorcycles. Now this is not sponsored by these folks, but you can check out cyclevin.com and it's an option, but it's a fee-based tool. So I would only use it for the bike I have decided to go with. Three, I want to know what the aftermarket has available for the bike. As do most bikers, I too like to customize my bike, so I want to make sure that I can actually do what I would like to do. You know, is there going to be a windshield for this bike? Is there going to be a fairing for it? Yeah, I had that had the same problem when I bought a pistol before. Yeah, there's what, no aftermarket. No fucking accessories for it. Yeah. So I, I do check for that. Or if I see that there's nothing there, but I still love the bike... Is it something I'm willing to redneck engineer to get it to or, where I want it? Or, or pay for that extra pay for fabrication. Piece, yeah. yeah. So there's that. And then I I really like to go on to social media and forums. Because I want to know what do owners actually think of their bike. And, you know... You have Facebook groups, you have Reddit, you have HD forums, uh, every Goldwing forums, everyone has a forum for something and there's subreddits for almost every, every model of motorcycle out there. So go and look, go and see what is being said and understand too that some people just like to bitch for the sake of bitching. Oh yeah. yeah. If, if you're looking at reviews and, and I've learned this. And it will, I learned this from reading something else. When you're going to buy something and there's they have reviews on it, whether it's, you know, a star based or anything, always look for like the middle of the ground reviews, the three stars. Yeah. Or the five stars if well, it's out of ten. Because those are the people that are like, this is really good about it, this is really bad about it, and it gives you both rather than, oh, this is the greatest thing in, on earth or this thing's a piece of shit. Right, right. So 
that's that's what I'm looking for. I look for consistent complaints. Oh yeah. So if some guy says, "Man, I get this weird death wobble as soon as I hit 95 miles an hour," and then you look underneath there and you me see too, a, me too, you know, me 100. Too. I'm, I see the same thing, or I'm getting the same thing at like 105. What the fuck? That type of thing. That's what I'm looking for because I want to see what's actually being said about it. Well, it's like the Milwaukee Eight. The the eighteen models was it the eighteen models that was having the the sumping issue? Yeah, for the eighteen touring. Yeah, yeah, for the touring. Yeah, and you know that that's one reason I waited. You know, give them another year or two to you know figure that shit out because they were having to f- fix these engines under under the warranty. They have an issue to recall, but they're still having to fix it under warranty. Right. So after I've done the research and all of that, my second favorite thing ever, negotiation. So I love haggling. I do. And I always haggle when I'm buying a vehicle. I live for the negotiation. I have zero shame asking for everything for free. And I'm going to. Oh, yeah. You know, I'll ask for a military discount. They say no. It's like, well, do you offer a police discount? When they say yes, it's like, well, you do realize that military is the police of the world, right? (laughs) We carry guns. We have badges of some form. And our job is to protect and serve. They they don't buy it. But I try. I say you're reaching. Oh, yeah. I reach like motherfucker. But... I am happy to say I've never paid MSRP for any motorcycle or vehicle I've ever purchased. And no one should. Yeah. Because I personally do not give a damn how much a manufacturer says their bike is worth. Their bike is worth whatever someone's willing to pay for it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, that's the key here. So... I only care about what I'm willing to pay, and I let that be known. And then the worst thing anyone could ever tell me is no. We cannot offer you that for free. But if you never ask, the answer will always be no. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's gotten to the point now where your wife asks for the military discount for the both of us. Yeah. Because it's either you or I who usually jump to it. Oh, yeah. And, hey, we have IDs that prove that we're we're veterans so if they offer it, i'm gonna take it oh yeah i mean i fucking ask everywhere yeah so i do have a custom or a trademark move i do whenever i'm buying any vehicles and you know i try to stick with the dealers that i can go to like hank at um at uh, cowboys and uh some other folks up in green that i buy my motorcycles from and they all know it I am getting a free coffee mug and a free fucking hat. Doesn't sound like much to anyone. You know, what's such a weird fucking thing to do. (laughs) So here's why. If I'm not at work or in a work environment, I'm wearing a hat. And Harley Davidson overcharges for everything that they have. So if I can get something for free, I'm happy. And the hat's not going to shrink like their t-shirts will, and their coffee mugs aren't going to shrink. Now, I get the nice, you know... That'd be weird if they did. The, the really expensive <laughs> Harley mugs. Because I just tell them I'm, I'm going to pick out a coffee mug, and then I get usually the most expensive one I can find. <laughs> but that's me. And that's just kind of the icing on the cake for me. Tracy has gotten to the point, she doesn't even roll her eyes when I ask for it anymore. <laughs> So, <clears throat> when I bought my bike, because I'm already a life member of Hog, yeah, they sent me a check because you get a free, you know, year's membership. They just sent me a check for the sixty bucks for the year, and said, "Hey, come, nice. spend, it, come spend it in our store." So, I mean, they're getting their money back, but still, you know. Well, that membership doesn't cost them a dime. Well, no. <laughs> so, but yeah, they sent me a check because you're a life member. Here's. Here's this, and it was literally a sixty dollar check uh, that was made out to me to spend at Harley. You know that was the stipulation, just like a coupon, I guess. But it was check form. It's a gift certificate. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. There you go. 
Got them coupons. Coops. Uh, number five on my list of things. Uh, keep your mouth fucking shut about your finances, your payment capabilities, etc. Do not give a dealership the intelligence they need to charge you more money. This is another reason I truly prefer getting a loan myself. But do what you do. But the first thing dealers or dealerships train their sales employees to ask. How much are you looking to spend per month? Because they can back into almost any number if it's reasonable. Yeah. They just extend the term or play with the interest rate. Yeah. Also, don't give them a, uh, a payoff until they give you a trade-in number. That was the big hurdle I had last time. That was hilarious. It wasn't a hard dealership, but same thing. Yeah. No, no. And when they ask that, I, was, I just tell them, I don't know. What's it worth to you? Yeah. They're like, oh, no, we can't give you a, a trading value until we know your payoff. I was like, do you realize I, I, I work in finance, and that's not how that works by any means? They'll try whatever they can. And, and look, let's be realistic. These salespeople are not rocket scientists. Well, and they're not your friends either. Oh, fuck no. No. Well, and if you were if, if you were sitting on the other side of the table, you'd be trying the exact same thing. Yeah, that's their livelihood. Yeah. yeah. Because they make money off of how much you spend. Exactly. So, and if you're a good salesman, which is why I go back to Hank. Yeah. He already knows. He goes in and I feel he fights to get me the best price. That's yeah. how I feel with, with Sam. Matter of fact, Sam called me today. Oh, yeah? Tell me happy birthday. Today's your birthday? No, it's coming up then. Oh, I was like, wait, it's not my birthday. <laughs> Facebook. Yeah, we're really tell shitty me friends. Your birthday? <laughs> Monday, my birthday. I don't even fucking know. Is the thirtieth your birthday? Oh yeah, yeah, it is Monday. <laughs> so that's why he called me today. Oh, that's nice yeah. of him. And that was it. He didn't call me to you know try and sell me anything or nothing like that. He said happy birthday and asked me how the bike was doing. And that was it. Yeah, and I, and I can appreciate that. He's building a relationship because he wants you to come back. And buy another bike yep. from him whenever you want. Yep. And going back to the why you go to Hank, I think one of Hank's uh, s- tricks, I wouldn't call it a trick, is that he does go and fight for everybody that goes to him because he knows that at the end of the day, it's kind of reversed. The, the, the quantity is going to pay off more than the quality. Yeah, he's a volume sales guy. Well, yeah. I yeah. Know. And if, well, I mean, if, like, if anybody was to ask, hey, I want to buy a Harley, where should I go? All three of us are going to say, you should go to Cowboys, and you should talk to Hank or Sam. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, that's or really any of the the guys there. I mean, I don't, I haven't worked with anybody that is, you know, on the shady side. I haven't either. I mean, I don't, I don't know the other two guys, anybody else other than those two guys. When I bought the Road King, so, I, I worked with one of the guys who's still there, and he was nice enough. He 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 wasn't too keen on how hard I was pressing on the pricing. Yeah. But I was like, look, dude, it's about you having your paycheck and me spending my paycheck. I care more about me than you. Oh, of course. So then, hey, at the end of the day, I still got what I wanted for the price I was wanting to pay. That's what matters. Um, Then finally, you have to do what all the typical millennials do or people are doing (laughs) these days and post an image of your new bike on Instagram. (laughs) Of course. Look, in conclusion to all of this, do your homework. Understand how dealers make money and understand your own finances. Oh, yeah. And here's the key. And people don't realize how easy this last little morsel of information is. Always have more information than the dealer. Oh, you should always have more information than anybody you're dealing with. That's, That's why... I wanted to put this out there. So many people have no clue how a dealership makes money. I they, mean, they they sell cars or they sell motorcycles. They sell parts and accessories. No, they you know they they add on everything. You know, you need the undercoat spray and yeah, you know, and all this. You need to know what you do and don't. Window etching, you know, and you need your VIN number etched on your window. No, I don't. The, you know how many places the VIN is on your car already. It doesn't need to be on the windows. Yeah. And plus, when I replaced the window because it got broke or a big chip hit it, hit the windshield, yeah. that VIN's gone. Yeah. So, 
shit like that. All right. So, closing argument. And Justin, I we kind of kept you out of the loop, so I'm going to have you answer this one first. What oh, is the Jesus. dirtiest deal you caught a dealer trying to do? Car, uh, motorcycle, whatever. I'll have to go back to the the whole payoff thing that I brought up earlier. They they would not give me a trade in value on my car, so they would not give me a t- exact number on what I'd be paying on my new truck without the payoff. And I just thought that was absolutely ridiculous because you know if if they know the payoff, they're going to work off of that number. I mean, oh, it yeah. just makes sense. Get them you know out of the red type of deal, and that's it. So I, I stuck to my ground. I, I pulled every trick in the book. I was like, all right, well, give me my keys. And I was literally driving out of the parking lot as they ran out of the office to flag me down. <laughs> and then finally were able to, to work out a deal. I'm like, it would be one thing if, if I was trying to buy a, a rare, you know, special edition Camaro, but I'm trying to trade one in to, to get a, a white Tundra in San Antonio where they make the Tundras. I can go literally oh, to 10 different dealerships in a 10 mile a radius. rock in San Antonio without hitting a white Tundra. Exactly. So I'm like, I have no reason to, to argue with you. But at the end of the day, I got what I wanted. I got way more than what I owed on it. So. <laughs> but that's because you got what it was worth. Yeah, exactly. And then, <laughs> it, well, to, to, to go on that, when I went back in, they offered me the the, the trade-in value on a standard SS Camaro. And I was like, I laughed at him. I was like, you guys aren't even in the ballpark right now. And basically, I just sit down there with Auto Trader open and show them that there were only three of these cars for sale in the entire state and what those values were going for before I was even able to get a number. Yeah, because well, they're, they're not working hard. They're- well, not only that, not only that it's, it's one of those... It kind of ties back to the, you know, you have to know more than the other person or you yeah. have to know at least as much. Yeah. And they they had no idea what they were dealing with. And to their credit, when I bought the car, they also didn't know what they were dealing with, but that worked <laughs> in my favor. <laughs> See? And that's another thing. You got to know what you're doing. Dude, the look on the dealership face when I pulled back the, the carpet in the trunk to check the uh, the... I don't know what they're called, the little three-digit codes for the the model. Oh, my God. Just to make sure someone didn't slap a uh, a little s- a kid on there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, man, the 1LEs are, are copycatted all the time. So I checked the steering wheel, the uh, steering column, the wheels, uh, and then the final thing was to check the actual manufacturer code on the inside of the trunk lining, and that's when I saw it was legit. So you knew more than the dealership. You had done your research. When you went up there, you knew what to inspect and how to figure out if it was exactly what you're looking for. Exactly. Cool. Cool. Ken? So this was, uh, so I was still married Mm -hmm. and I was living in Montana. So my ex at the time was working for a dealership and they had several dealerships in town. Uh, Really? That was just my gut. That was your gut? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't fart. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah, that, you might need to go shit. It's just grumbling. Oh, I do. Okay. <laughs> well, then I'll try and hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, so she worked for the Honda dealership, and they, owned, they also owned the Dodge dealership in town. Well, at the time, Dodge was running uh, a sale. Well, come to find out that what was happening was Dodge was selling the dealership, you know, buy a hundred of our trucks at this price to sell them at this price. That was that was the thing. So that we can you can sell a whole bunch of trucks, right? <clears throat> what the dealership was doing was they were taking all those trucks that they were that the deal that the manufacturer said you will sell them at this price, and they were of course marking them up to regular retail. And finally, they were caught. Mm. <laughs> But yeah, I mean that's that's some of the dirty shit that they do. Yeah. So mine is I was younger, I was probably twenty one ish, twenty ish, and I'd went into a Ford dealership. And well, I know I know that I was, <laughs> uh, my, my first mistake, right? A fixer repair daily. 
fucked on race day. <laughs> and so I went in and they were like, well, we, uh, and I, I fell for the trap of how much can you afford? Yeah. I say I, I fell for it because I told them a number. I told them 300 bucks a month is what I'm willing to pay for a truck. So they, they went and they came back and I already knew that the truck was going to be around 400 a month, um, just through normal financing. They said, well, we can get it down to 375 um, on our red carpet option. Oh, the red carpet option. Have you ever heard <laughs> of the red carpet option from Ford? It's a lease. But they oh, don't call wow. it a lease. They call it the red carpet option. It's Damn. The, the underlying language is, is a lease. Yeah. So they tried that, and they tried to show me how, well, you're not going to keep the truck for more than you know, three or four years anyway. So you drive Did they already know you? Years and they, then you can turn it in and get another vehicle. I was like, it says here it can only drive 6,000 miles a year. How the fuck, living in Texas, do you only drive 6,000 miles a year? What the fuck are you thinking? And, oh yeah, we went back and forth, back and forth, and then they tried to bait and switch on me. They said, okay, we'll sell, sell you the truck for this amount. And they came down to three fifty a month. And they're like, okay, three fifty a month, three years. I'm like, this is still a fucking lease. <laughs> they're like, well, yeah, but it's cheaper. And we upped your miles to 10,000 miles a year. I want to buy a vehicle try to buy a truck and you you're not willing to sell me a truck gotcha fuck you and i walked out and went and bought dodge ram but and there's your second mistake <laughs> i don't know anyways <laughs> i look at it like this i was young and dumb i didn't have a coach to tell me all this stuff because I want to do it on my own. Oh yeah, you know my dad, he's a dumbass. What does he know? He knew a lot. <laughs> they, as they tend to do. Yeah, because they, they've been there, done that. Yeah, they've already made all these same mistakes. But back to what you were talking about, as far as like rebates and things of that nature that um, you'll see manufacturers doing. You know, right now, uh, GM. C and Ram trucks are doing this big, huge sell because they already know they're they're going to be they're going to tank. Their stocks are going to tank, so they're trying to sell or move units. Zero percent interest for eighty four months Damn. on any of the Duramax. Well, the non selling Duramax diesel trucks and the non selling like tradesman model of the twenty five hundred uh, diesel ram truck nice i'm like that sounds amazing then you go look at the fine print and that's where you, that's that's part of the research because if you already know that the the manufacturer is giving you a rebate oh the, the money's already built in so when they when the dealer tells you the price and it's like two thousand under msrp but the rebate's supposed to be 7500 you know, under MSRP or whatever special cash allowance bullshit they're giving you. All of that matters. And they're oh, yeah. going to try their damnedest not to lose any money. And uh, look, look, dealerships, like legitimate dealerships, the big ones, they've never, they're never going to lose money on a deal from you. No. They just won't. I mean, and, and they're big for a reason because... They know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. They've done it well enough. They've pleased enough people to get them. Like you look at Red Macomb here in San Antonio. How many fucking Red Macomb dealerships are there in town? Almost every every style. Of I'd say car. at least five. Yeah, I was going to say at least five. Yeah. On their new lots, yeah. So, I mean. And there's a couple of standalone Red Macomb used car lots. Yeah. Yeah. So, they obviously take care of their customers enough that they've grown that much yeah it's not cheap no to uh no. to own a dealership especially one of that nature but 
what are y'all's thoughts you know leave us a comment in the uh, video for this and tell us what are some of the dirty deals that you've seen or that you've gone through when you've been trying to purchase a new motorcycle or a new vehicle for that matter you know the more we talk about these things the more we expose the problems that we are seeing out there the more people we can help or, or so you're saying it's like see something say something yeah quit letting these fuckers get away with it yeah pretty much yeah thank you for tuning in to between two wheels podcast to see the show notes for this and all of our episodes to find links to our social media and patreon page where we are raising money for project clean slate head over to our website at www.betweentwowheels.com the two is spelled out t-w-o on behalf of justin uncle ken i am johnny roblox saying be yourself unless you're a jerk then be someone better peace I, I, I be dead, dude. I like, I like